the destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, July 5th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, a reprise of our interview with David Blight, Sterling Professor of History and Director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University, on to discuss his book, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, and also Reconstruction a little bit. Folks, uh, yes, it is our special July 5th uh, show. We are uh, on vacation, but uh, this interview, which originally ran uh, in the spring of 2020, um, can turn down the uh, music. The uh, this ran in the, the spring of 2020. I first, uh, David Blight first came to my attention through a 12-part audio series. Maybe it's a little bit longer of uh, Reconstruction, a course that he taught at Yale. It was the most fascinating um, and enlightening piece of audio I've heard, except, of course, uh, from my own. Um, it really Reconstruction is such a hugely important part of, uh, of our nation's history, completely undertaught. And of course, um, Frederick Douglass. His story, also one that um, it's getting a lot of attention. People are talking about him quite a bit these days. But um, also, uh, Frederick Douglass, a historical figure uh, who's um, who has been undertaught in this country. I don't know how else to articulate that. And we chose this um, to reprise this uh, today. Uh, Emma and I are both off, Matt and the gang and Brendan uh, off in part because um, it's just a fascinating uh, interview, and uh, uh, Blight is a um, is a real treasure. Uh, but Frederick Douglass also gave a really um, important speech in 1852 on July 5th. I guess somebody could do the math, but exactly on this day. Uh, and he gave it to, uh, in Rochester, New York, uh, addressing the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. And the name of the speech, which I think was actually titled maybe after the fact, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? It's a fascinating speech. Um, and it uh, it was delivered on the 5th, obviously. But it, it it really does outline a lot of the issues that we even talk about uh, continuing today in terms of the relationship between the United States of America and, and, and slavery and black people. Uh, and um, in many respects, I mean, change a couple of things here and there, and you could give that speech uh, today. But uh, here is uh, David Blight. Um, this interview, like I said, took place in the spring of 2020. Um, enjoy this, and uh, I'll be back at the end of it to uh, sign off. Folks, uh, today's show brought to you by, um, in part, anyways, uh, Liquid IV. It is the uh, thing that keeps us hydrated around here. I have, um, it's also the thing that I have now replaced, not totally, but largely, uh, my coffee, because I use the uh, matcha Liquid IV. Uh, Emma, big fan of the acai, so taught me that's how you pronounce it, but I've enjoyed the pear, the strawberry, the lemon-lime. They had one that had, like, lemongrass that they sent me. Watermelon. 
It's fantastic. Very summary right now. Liquid IV contains five essential vitamins, more vitamin C than an orange, as much potassium as a banana. It is healthier than those uh, super sugary sports drinks. There are no artificial flavors. There's no artificial preservatives and less sugar than an apple. Liquid IV is powered by a cellular transport technology. The bottom uh, line is it has an optimal mix of glucose, sodium, and potassium, which delivers water and nutrients to the bloodstream faster and quicker and more efficiently, uh, up to three times as efficiently as water alone. Plus, the company has donated over 4 million servings in response to COVID-19. They're donating products to hospitals, first responders, food banks, and more. Uh, Folks, I mean, I drink liquid IV more or less on a daily basis. Uh, Their matcha blend is what basically substitutes for me for coffee, but it also keeps me hydrated. So I'm getting both ends of that. But if I overindulge, maybe I'll have some at night at the end of a long night of, you know, overindulging, maybe the next morning. Um, when I start traveling again, I'm on it. When uh, Saul was out there playing uh, baseball in 95 degree heat, and me too, because I had to pitch, uh, made a big bottle of it. We shared it. Uh, much more efficient way of delivering hydration to you. Cannot go wrong. Grab your liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code majority rep at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you uh, get better hydration today using the promo code majority rep, not majority report, majority rep at liquidiv.com. Check it out. Also, I've said this many times, the best time to look for new employees is when you don't have to. ZipRecruiter is my number one go-to. Recent data shows that out of the all the female-owned businesses, it's estimated that one in three is owned by a mom. You ever wonder how uh, those amazing moms and dads, this guy, find time to hire their business, uh, their businesses while juggling their families? I can tell you, uh, ZipRecruiter made the whole process much, much easier. And you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. CEO and founder Talia Goldstein is one such mompreneur. She's a mother of two. She has a personalized matchmaking company, Three Day Rule, which apparently is constantly growing. She needs to hire several matchmakers a month. So what does she do? She uses ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter's powerful technology goes out and it grabs applicants for you. Doesn't just put it out there. It finds them. Like we found Brendan. I've told this story many times, but that's how it worked. Brendan applied to the show. Boom. I, I mean, we had 12 great applicants at the time. But Brendan was just, just a little bit better. Um, so Talia is not the only employer who loves ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. I was one of them. So many candidates. And the best part about it for me was that it, it gives you a whole system and interface to organize it really, really well. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. Special offer is only good at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority, M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire. And lastly, uh, today's show is sponsored to you, uh, sponsored by, I should say, by Grove. Find it at Grove.co. Just grove.co. I'm sure most of you know the importance of using natural products. You want stuff that's not going to be dangerous for your kids, not going to be dangerous for your pets, not going to be dangerous for yourself. But where do you go to find them? If you're lucky, you you stumble on a store that sells some of them, but you got to weed through a bunch of other stuff. I have the solution for you. It has been one that I've been using now, at least I think for two years on a regular basis. Grove Collaborative. It is an online marketplace that delivers healthy home, beauty, and personal care products directly to you. One-stop shopping, folks. For me, I get my, uh, I get my Mrs. Myers. I get my um, seventh generation. 
frankly, I also get a bunch of Grove branded products. They have a great concentrated um, spray thing. I got Grove spray bottles. I've now actually groved my whole house. I have, they have a kid's um, hand soap pump, but I use it everywhere because if it drops that way, because I got kids and they use the hand soap everywhere. So it's not just in the bathroom. I got it at the kitchen sink. I use Grove products uh, and I bought a bunch of uh, soap refillers, but they have also uh, the seventh generation. They have it, the dish soap. I got a bunch of the Grove uh, laundry detergent too, actually, and that's refillable. But it is the it is the ease in which you're able to find a bunch of natural products that makes it really a no brainer for me. You can join over two million households who have trusted Grove Collaborative to make their homes happier and healthier. Plus, shipping is fast and free on your first order. Check it out. You want to have natural products. You want to make it easy for yourself. This is the answer. Grove.co slash majority. Making the switch to natural products has never been easier. For a limited time, when our listeners go to Grove.co slash majority, you're going to get to choose a free gift with your first order of $30 or more. But you have to use our special code. Go to Grove.co slash majority to get your exclusive offer. That's Grove.co slash majority. Check it out. All of those will be in the uh, podcast and YouTube description. Okay. Now uh, to Professor David Blight. All right. I'm going to take a quick break. Oh, do we don't need to take a quick break, do we? Um, mm-hmm. Joining us right now is, do we have him? Okay, great. Uh, the Sterling Professor of American History, the director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University, Professor David Blight, um, author, his most recent anyways, is uh, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you very much. It's very good to be here. Um, I have to tell you that um, I have told so many people about your, um, your, your course on, um, on the Civil War. It has Honestly, um, I was just mentioning before you came on, I got about a half a dozen IMs as we announced that you were on the program today because I've told so many people to listen to it. And it is, I cannot recommend it enough. It has really um, changed my perspective on the history of this country. And uh, so I can't tell you what an honor it is to have you here. Um, you. So let's, but let's start in first with, with Frederick Douglass, and then I want to move on to sort of like some of, some of the, that, that, that aspects. Um, apparently, more and more people are talking about Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Uh, and uh, this, of course, is in reference to Donald Trump, I think, maybe being aware of your book in some fashion, uh, or at least the, maybe not, <laughs> or the, the, the Pulitzer that was awarded uh, to it. But for those people who are not aware of Frederick Douglass being talked about, will you just give us sort of like the, um, the broad strokes of, 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 of who he was? Because I think Frederick Douglass, I think Reconstruction, Civil War, mm-hmm. uh, is really undertaught in American history for some reason. Yeah, well, it's, it's never felt untaught to me because I've taught it all my life, but that's the bubble I live in. Uh, that comment from Trump didn't come from any knowledge of my book or, frankly, from any knowledge at all. Uh, but Douglass is uh, a towering figure across the 19th century. Uh, he is, in many ways, the prose poet of American democracy. For those who don't know him yet, uh, you will discover him primarily in his words. He wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography, uh, three different autobiographies. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of short-form editorials, political editorials in his newspaper that he published for 16 years. And he wrote literally thousands of speeches. Uh, He may have been most famous in the public, at least, as an orator. And indeed, he was one of the greatest orators of the 19th century of all of American history. But his story, of course, begins with the fact that he was born a slave. He grew up 20 years as a slave, born out on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, he had the. Uh, he was born in, in a backwater, a, a really a kind of nowhere backwater of the American slave society. 
And uh, we really probably wouldn't even know about him had he not been sent to Baltimore for portions of those 20 years as a slave. He was first sent there to be the companion of, the, of his owner's nephew. Uh, then he was sent back uh, in his teens. Um, he spent nine of his 20 years as a slave in Baltimore, a, a, a major ocean port, a major shipbuilding city, uh, a city with a, with a view on the ocean and the maritime world, and a city in which he lived as a slave, but he lived amongst or in the midst uh, a very large free black community. In fact, there were more free blacks in Baltimore than there were slaves. And that has a great deal to do with how he was able to cultivate language, cultivate his oratorical skills, cultivate his reading, uh, cultivate his interest in the Bible and in local churches, uh, and indeed have a degree at least of uh, physical freedom of movement around the city in his teenage years, late teenage years. But he escapes at age 20 and, um, you know, within only three years in the North, he became um, an itinerant orator on the abolitionist circuit and he took it by storm. So he then becomes this figure of words, of language, of the, of the extraordinary ability to capture uh, first in his oratory, then later in his writing in autobiographies, in his newspaper, and so on, this greatest American dilemma, this greatest problem in American history, the problem of slavery, race, the coming of, uh, you know, the turbulent 1850s, the coming of disunion and civil war, uh, his role as an interpreter in the midst of this civil war from his newspaper perch in Rochester, New York, is uh, crucial. Um, but then he's going to live all the way to 1895. Uh, he lives, in effect, across the whole 19th century almost. Uh, he lived to see all of his great events, interpret its great events, and play a role in most of those great events. He's one of those rare figures who is, well, for two reasons. First, he's born out there on the Eastern shore in 1818. This is before steamboats, before the telegraph, before the railroad, before all those elements of modernity that would so change the United States and the world. But he's gonna live all the way to 1895 when for God's sake, you can cross the Atlantic in eight days on a steamship. They have something called a phonograph that can record voices, although Almost unbelievably, his voice was never recorded that we know of. Uh, he lived to a new age, electric light bulbs. They even had the first telephones. He lives to, the, to a new age of, of things modern, of modernity. But the other thing is, he is one of those rarest of activists or you know, radical reformers who actually lives to see his cause triumph. He, he lives to see his cause win in the abolition of slavery in the midst of the Civil War, and then the transformation of the United States uh, under a new constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution made it a new constitution, and therefore a new republic. But he's also going to live long enough to see those triumphs all but betrayed and crushed in the uh, post-Reconstruction uh, South, uh, which leads to you know, uh, uh, terrorism and the Jim Crow system, which is being put in place uh, by the time he died. So it's an, it's an epic life. And uh, he left so much for us to conjure with uh, as a thinker and as a writer and as a speaker. Um, and we return to him over and over now, those who have discovered him, uh, and we're trying to make more people do that. Uh, we return to him as a voice to help us understand what is this thing called America? If America is an idea, what, what is it? What is it? Uh, if America is democracy, what does that mean? And how did it get transformed in all that slaughter of the Civil War? Uh, what was Reconstruction? Uh, what was it reconstructing? And uh, why is race such an enduring, 
seemingly eternal problem in American society, whatever we say about ourselves and whatever we tell the world are our creeds, why can we never completely solve this issue? There is so much to learn about those questions in Douglas's confrontations with these questions, 160, 150, 140 years ago that can really help us today. There, there's so much that, uh, that you know, there, there's moments where, where in his life where he says, and uh, in, in you talk about, uh, you write about this, I should say, um, that are so reminiscent, you know, uh, don't have the exact date when he says that, uh, that uh, white, uh, that, that black values uh, lives are just not valued by white people. I mean, this is something obviously that we we're hearing uh, echoes, if not just exact uh, echoes of uh, um, still, um, 130, 40 years later. But one of the things I want to ask you about, which I found sort of fascinating, and I didn't really, I don't, I didn't have any sense of this, was the 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 relationship within him between sort of like his, I don't know how to really express this, but the his radicalism and his pragmatism, and uh, in some ways, there. I, I I go to this because I maybe I have a a, a paucity of, of 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 metaphors, but there's a quality of Lenny Bruce to his progression <laughs> when he goes from being sort of a a fa- and I didn't realize how sort of like renowned he was for his oratory skills, right? Yeah. Like he's a what I would say like in, in Lenny Bruce's sort of like early stage, he's a you know he's a comedian, he's a good comedian, but then at one point he starts getting much more radical, and there's there's a lot more questions and. There's that dynamic that goes on with him, and it and it's sort of like the pendulum swings within him throughout mm-hmm. his life from when he he becomes when he has that first when he when he says that uh, that he became a man from a slave. I may I don't have my notes aren't, but he comes a he becomes a slave to a man by having a physical fight. Yeah. Um. Yet. He he. So much of what his skill set is from actually like performing and talking. We can right. you talk about that theme to, internal to him? Sure. There are many contradictions and paradoxes about Douglas, which is of course one of the things that makes him so interesting. That actual passage from the original autobiography is, uh, "I have shown you how a slave was. I'm so, I have shown you how a man was made a slave. Now I will show you how a slave becomes a man." Now that comes right after he has this epic fight to this struggle with an overseer named Edward Covey to whom he has been rented out for nine or 10 months. And Covey beat him savagely. And Covey was a real person, by the way. He, and Douglas isn't making that up. He's not making up Covey anyway. Uh, and that, that's a classic kind of male a uh, resurrection story in the sense of he resurrects himself from despair and this constant physical beating in in bondage under Covey by fighting, by, by fighting back by, through his fists. Now, you don't find that story in women's slave narratives because a woman taking on an overseer was a pretty, pretty hard thing to do, although there are some examples of it. Um, but yeah, Douglas grew up having to fight with his fist. There's no question about that. He learned how to do that. He got the hell beat out of him in the uh, shipyards of Baltimore more than once. In fact, he got smashed in the head with an anvil by a sailor. Um, the, the white sailors sometimes resented him because they feared, you know, this black kid's going to take their job. Uh, not a new thing. You know, he'll encounter that again, even in the North. Um but, but to your question about the radicalism and the pragmatism, it's one of the most interesting things about Douglas, because he starts out as a true radical abolitionist, no question. He's a Garrisonian, meaning he's a follower of William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison discovered him in many Garrison and his people, and they brought him out on the lecture circuit. They, they helped even support his family to a degree, especially when he went off to England uh, for 18 months. Uh, and, and he was in all in all major ways, a moral suasionist, meaning under Garrison, the, the, the strategy was to change the hearts and minds of your audiences, to appeal to their hearts and minds. And you did it with a very radical, often Old Testament biblical message. 
that they either come to the altar and reform or they are about to be destroyed. Now, he learns with time, not too long either, before he's even out of his 20s, that that kind of approach is perhaps not going to ultimately win the day. And he becomes much more interested in politics. And in the wake of uh, the Mexican War, and especially the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which endangers every Black person in the North now, he begins to sidle up to some degree, at least rhetorically, to the possible uses of violence. He breaks away from Garrison and begins to embrace uh, what was known as the anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution, trying to find a way to get the law on the side of abolition, instead of always saying the Constitution is just hopelessly complicitous with slavery. But mostly what Douglas was learning is that slavery was a gigantic moral problem, but it was also a gigantic political problem, meaning you had to find a way to fight it in the halls of power. That means automatically, you're gonna to have to find a way to make deals with political parties, with people who at least have sympathy, you know, toward anti-slavery. The course of the 1850s, the decade that leads up to the American Civil Wars, when Douglas transforms to a degree from a radical abolitionist into a still radical, but a pragmatic abolitionist, looking for every way possible first to damage this institution of slavery and then to destroy it. And it, it gets him to the point where he is at least open to supporting something like the, the original Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln, although that's, that's a difficult dance for him at first. But it's, it's, a, it's the prototype in American history, especially for a black leader who's always on the outside knocking on the door. You know, there's always the radical outsider but is now trying to find a foothold inside of institutions, inside of a political party, and maybe even inside the government when you can find sympathy and interest and you know, common will um, uh, with white politicians. This was never an easy thing. And the oh, wow. Civil War is going to solve some of these things for him, but, but of course, in massive bloodshed. I, what what struck me too about that transition, particularly that period when he returns from uh, the British Isles after right. uh, 16, 17 months, and, and this is in forty seven, I think it was, right. where right. he he, it's almost like his anger is is ramped up on some level because mm -hmm. because you as you write like he's returning to he's he's sort of tasted what a society where he is not, um, you know, uh, a part of a slave class or, you know, or, or, or at least, you know, and he returns back to America and it makes him, uh, it makes him more angry, which, you know, I can, I can, you know, mm -hmm. that makes total sense, but his reaction is to become more pragmatic. Like he harnesses that rage in a way that is very uh, productive, I guess, in some way. It takes time, uh, but yeah, this is where the, the mastery of language and the power of words are so important because there's a lot of rage in this young Frederick Douglass in his 20s and now moving into his 30s, tremendous rage in him. But he had the great good fortune to become so adept at both speaking and writing. He had that ability to process this rage and now he creates his own newspaper and he has to put that baby out week after week after week, as he says, I had to have something to say every week. And he did. But you're pointing to the British Isles, the first trip there of 18 months in 45 to 47. It's one of the two or three most important pivotal turning points in Douglas's life. He goes there, a young, uh, 25, 27 year old Garrisonian moral suasionist, never been on a steamboat before, steamship. But he is embraced first in Ireland for a month, then in Scotland, even more so, because he arrived in Scotland during one of their great ecclesiastical wars over whether to send money back to the American South that had been raised to support the new Church of Scotland. And then in Britain, for the following year, he, uh, he makes all kinds of close friendships, relationships, 
uh, lifetime relationships uh, in, in, in some cases with the British, Irish, Scottish anti-slavery movement. And he is treated like a very special, you know, some of them treated him like this exotic brown black man from the United States, a former slave, like an exhibit they could go see. But on the other hand, some of them embraced him uh, as, as, as dear friends. And he'd never experienced that before. And he encountered some, but only a small degree of overt racism around the British Isles. He certainly saw some of it. But when he arrived back in the US, he's an angry young black man because he's coming back into the hothouse of American racism. And the first speech, when he goes out on the, on the stump, right after he gets back in 47, he is saying things like, and this is all in the book, he's saying things like, I have no country. I have no patriotism. My country hates me. I hate it back. At one point, he says, I only look forward to seeing its constitution shattered into pieces. One of the radical abolitionists, Wendell Phillips, took him aside at one point and said, Fred, tone it down, man. You're going to lose the audience here. Uh, but he wasn't toning anything down. But what he was beginning to learn is how to harness, as you say, harness that power of anger and rage into arguments. Now, Douglas's life, though, is an interesting test, as it has been for so many other writers in history. How much can language change the world? How much can a writer speaker, however brilliant, change the world? How much does that writer speaker have to find ways also to harness events and harness political institutions uh, to harness the society somehow into this use of language to change the world? Um, you know, our greatest writers have always had to ask this. They want to change. Every, every major writer wants to change something about their society or their world. But how much can they? Uh, Douglas is a fascinating story of examining that process uh, because he did have an enormous impact. I speculate in the book that, that number one, he may have been seen as, a, as an orator in particular, or heard, therefore, by more Americans than anyone else who ever lived in the 19th century because his speaking tours were just ubiquitous all the time year after year after year, right into old age, right up until the last year of his life. And also, I speculate in the book that he may have traveled more miles than any other American in this pursuit, except probably Mark Twain. And Twain went to Asia, so that's kind of, you know, cheating. <laughs> but, room, I guess. But he had this problem eventually of visibility and fame, uh, you know, which can be pleasurable but also perilous we should also say that that era uh, when he comes back is when he um, um uh, gave his speech about the fourth of july which yeah. has has i think you know um uh, resonated particularly in this era uh, oh, yeah. but but do you think just uh, you know uh, that speech by the way had its its greatest month ever this summer it was just being used everywhere and yes. I was being interviewed three times a day about that speech during the week of 4th of July. There'd never been a week like that about Douglas, which is amazing. I, I mean, that's, I think, um, I, I'm in some ways, activists today, writers today, speakers today, doing that very thing, using the events of, of, of the moment to, yeah. to, to, to yeah. leverage. But do you think that that dynamic, and this is more, I guess, a uh, sort of like a, a, a parallel uh, to, to, do you think, that dynamic of writers, I mean, the, the ability for him to be so dominant, and which is sort of shocking, and so, uh, was also a function of the time. I mean, there are less people writing, and he yeah. is a, a, a really unique voice in that era mm -hmm. of, of someone who was that well-educated mm -hmm. and that talented in oratory and writing, but also had been born a slave um is there yeah can that be replicated today or what does it look like if it's yeah well the, the, yeah that's a good question the replication of that today would be uh you know the kid from nowhere 
and this happens in America, it's rare, but the kid from nowhere with almost no education who nevertheless somebody, I mean, today wouldn't be the kid with, without a single day in a school in his life. That just wouldn't happen today. I mean, you know, uh, credentialing is just too important today, but it would be the kid from almost nowhere who manages to get into, uh, to get a decent education somehow, a teacher finds him, moves him on to this and to that. He gets into a college. He gets hooked on to, I don't know, this professor and that professor, and and then maybe into a law school or something, or not, uh, but, but who has an enormous talent, uh, an artistic talent, a political talent, a, a, a linguistic talent. It still happens. I mean, there are... Uh, there are these stories that still happen in America. Um, and, you know, uh, Barack Obama was not necessarily that person, given the kind of education he had, although, you know, he does come from obscurity uh, and manages to be bright enough to get sent first to a college in L.A. and then to Columbia and on and on and on. The rest is history. Um, but, but he was a prodigy. Douglas was a prodigy. And he, there are aspects of his abilities and talents that are explainable. Uh, his abilities with language, I do deal with in the book. I mean, it, it comes very early. He has certain lucky breaks while he's a slave that introduces him to language and to, and to, and to the Bible and biblical storytelling and so on and so on. And I'm convinced he's, he was, when he was a, both a child and then a teenager, um, like kids today, any kid, he found the one thing he was really good at, which was standing up and speaking, or, you know, he could read, and all of his fellow slave, his buddies, he called them his band of brothers, uh, you know, male slaves, some of whom were younger, most of whom were older than him, they couldn't read or write, he had a special talent, and he found the one thing he was good at, and he just was going to get better and better at it, just like today, a kid who can you know, dribble between his legs and behind his back has got to start, you know, or a kid that can uh, do science projects and is a prodigy, you know, th th this is what Douglas was, but he never set foot a day in his life in a real classroom. Now, nor did Abraham Lincoln, except for like right. a couple of years. So this, in the 19th century, this was all much more possible or likely than it ever would be today. Uh, but you got to also know here that this was the golden age of oratory. Uh, it was the only, great orators were the only game in town in the 19th century. Right. The Chautauqua circuit, circuit you know, the, the lecture series. Ralph Waldo Emerson made his fame as much from his traveling lecture series as he did from writing his great essays. I mean, uh, uh, Emerson reached more auditors than he did readers. It's hard to imagine that about a, a writer like Emerson, whom we know now as the great essayist on the page, but he traveled all the time giving these lectures. Uh, so the person who could, who could hold an audience for an hour or two out in a small town in Ohio or a village in Pennsylvania or you know, upstate New York um, was a hit and, and, and was, was, uh, was needed. Now, and it was the slavery question above all else and the abolition movement above all else that spread um, information, spread uh, reform movements uh, more than anything. And the abolitionists made great use of the new modern technologies. And Douglas became very adept at all of them. First is transportation, the railroads, second, is the Rotary Press that made possible now weekly and daily newspapers. And then, of course, simply The Voice. Uh, and in the book, I have many accounts, particularly from newspapers, of people describing Douglas as a speaker. It became a kind of, especially in, in the aftermath of the Civil War, it became a kind of wonder of the American world if you could see Douglas. You know, if you, oh, Frederick Douglass is coming to town. Even if you didn't always agree with him, you, it was a thing. Well, that's the part that, that, that sort of fascinates me because you mentioned, you know, these other, these other speakers in that golden era. Uh, you mentioned Barack Obama, who has sort of his story where he came out. But the, 
Douglas is a guy who is challenging sort of the fundamental building blocks of the country. In, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lives. And so- He does, wants to tear it down. Right. I mean, does, does, does he achieve, achieve this level of celebrity and fame despite that? Or does that, is the movement that's associated with that part of propelling him up? It's both. It's both. I mean, the early abolitionist, and when he joins the movement in the early 1840s and right through the 40s into the 50s, abolitionists were extremely unpopular. Now, they had a following, of course, uh, and there were sections of the North in which they were always safe and they had a following. There were towns that were known to be abolitionists and towns that were not, uh, but they were notorious, notorious. I mean, we don't have any firm statistics, but probably no more than 15% of the northern population, this is in the free states by 1850 or so, uh, was ever associated with any anti-slavery society. It meant the vast majority had nothing to do with abolitionism, in fact, hated it. But one of the techniques, directly to your question, one of the techniques he learned uh, from the Garrisonian abolitionists who kind of brought him out on the circuit, was to rile up an audience. The whole point of this was to stimulate your audience, to get your audience angry. Even if they threw a few tomatoes at you, that was success because you got their attention. The whole idea was to chastise as you instruct. It's a very Christian kind of message. It's an Old Testament, you know, Jeremiadic kind of technique. It's a preacher's technique. I mean, I'm going to call you to the altar now. I want to make you hurt. I'm going to make you look at your hypocrisy, which is what the great 4th of July speech does, among other things. And I'm going to get you angry. I'm going to trouble you. Uh, you're not going to like what you're going to hear here, but you might listen. That's what prophets do, by the way. Uh, prophets are not, well, first of all, there aren't very many of them. And prophets are not usually just nice people you want to have lunch with. Right. They trouble you. Um, let's turn a little bit to, uh, to, to Reconstruction. I mean, I, I, my uh, understanding of Reconstruction um, came so much from, from, from your work and from Eric Foner's. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but the idea of it being the, the second American Revolution, as you call it, mm -hmm. and you know, in, in many respects, I, I liken it to like uh, Yavna for, for Judaism, like the rabbinic sure. Judaism that we practice today that everybody perceives as Judaism is actually sort of like version two. Right. And, and in many respects, the America, the founding fathers that we have today were the ones who basically constructed, uh, you know, the 14th Amendment and 13th and 15th, but the 14th. And under what is the importance of understanding, of coming to that understanding? Well, first of all, I love the, the, the Jewish or Hebrew prophetic analogy here because it is, it is the one Douglas used so much. Uh, the temple ha was destroyed. The, t the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, as the prophet said, because it had to be. The people had become so corrupt, so hopelessly poisoned by their own venality and hubris and all the rest. The temple was going to be destroyed and they were going to go into exile and they may or may not find their way back. That's the great story of Exodus, right? Well, uh, Douglas will interpret the Civil War in many ways through that lens, not exclusively, but in, and so did so many other Americans for that matter. The Civil War in Reconstruction is the destruction of the first American Republic. And you don't need Frederick Douglass to tell you that. I mean, he, he does tell you that a thousand times over. But Lincoln argued the same thing. What's the argument of the Gettysburg Address? Well, that short, you know, most well-known American speech, if people just look at it. There's Lincoln standing in that cemetery and saying, um, the four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on, their, on this continent a new nation. But he's saying that nation has is being destroyed right here we're burying the results of that destruction and we have to imagine a new one now he didn't have that all figured out yet but he did actually use the word equality in that speech he drew that off the declaration of independence um now douglas and many others saw the civil war as this reckoning 
that destroyed that first slaveholding republic of 80 some years. It did it in horrible bloodshed, but they found a way to argue that that was necessary bloodshed. That's an easy thing to say, not an easy thing to reap and to do. But out of it came this responsibility, at least among the leadership of that Republican party that had been founded back in the 1850s to resist the future of slavery and they did. And they took response, the leadership anyway, took responsibility for the freedom of these 4 million slaves and for answering the question, now who are they? What are they? The 13th Amendment says, before the war ever ends, slavery shall never exist. Any kind of involuntary servitude can never exist. The 14th Amendment, the most important of all, especially with Section 1, is the Equal Protection Clause. It's the Equality Before Law Clause. It's the Birthright Citizenship Clause. It's the Equality Clause of our Constitution. And the 15th, of course, is the Voting Rights Amendment, 1869-1870, uh, which didn't go as far as the radicals like Douglas would have wanted because it didn't prevent qualifications, tests of all kinds. But there it was now, the right to vote, at least for Black men. This was a new constitution. This was defining the American Republic now in a, in a wholly new way, a new inclusive way. It's saying it's being founded now on some degree of equality between the races, the ethnicities, the religions. And Douglas was right at the heart of this. This was Douglas's whole argument about what this Armageddon had been all about. And for about four to five to six years, depending on where you're standing, they reinvented the United States. But every great rev and it's a revolution, let's face it. What are you know, there are different kinds of revolutions, aren't there? But every revolution <coughs> always foments a counter-revolution. I mean, if it's important enough, there will be a reaction. And how we've seen this again and again and again. Well, what is Trumpism? But in some ways, a counter-revolution against uh, the Obama presidency and against uh, liberalism and against uh, so many of the great changes of the 1960s. Even, even the so-called Reagan revolution, which now gets viewed in sepia tones. The Reagan revolution was a revolution against the 60s. It was against civil rights. It was against feminism. It was against all the rights movements. Anyway, the first great counter-revolution in American history was the white South's ability to revive under the reformed Democratic Party and through the uses of terror and violence, the worst levels of it we've ever seen in our history, um, the ability of the white South to revive in the 1870s to take back control of their state governments, what they called Southern redemption, and then ultimately to defeat the reconstruction governments and the reconstruction laws and measures, and especially to defeat black suffrage, black voting, brought about eventually, essentially, uh, an end to reconstruction around 1877 and into the 1880s. And it made possible it didn't happen overnight by any means, but it made possible the evolution then of a, of a system of first de facto and then de jure uh, segregation of the races, eventually into this elaborate system of Jim Crow laws uh, and, and, and an American system in effect of racial apartheid. Um, so and that it, counter revolution it, lasted, well, I mean, it lasted in that form for decades. Yeah, uh, 70 years or so. It's, uh, yeah, it depends on when you date its beginning. I mean, the real, the real Jim Crow system, at least in law, begins in the 1890s. I mean, the 1890s, the first uh, overt disfranchisement law passed by Mississippi. But by, about, by 1900, and especially by 1910, all of the ex-Confederate states have become completely Jim Crow societies. And so have other sections of the country, by the way, including in the North. And a part of this process all along has been extremely overt uses of discrimination, 
and extremely overt uses of the denial of the right to vote, of voter fraud, and extremely brutal uses of terrorist violence. We, I just the other day, we had um, uh, Susan Mettler on who was talking about Wilmington, which I had never, uh, was not aware, yeah. uh, which was, uh, you know, horrific. And we, you know, we- 98, yeah. I just story. reviewed a new book on that by uh, uh, David Zucchino. It's coming out in the New York Review of Books. It's, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, it's a story Americans need to know better because it really was a, it was a white supremacist coup d'etat that took over the state of North Carolina, where an interracial coalition had held on quite well, thank you, in the 1890s. And black politicians were getting elected, especially in eastern yes. North Carolina around Wilmington for years. In fact, the, the only remaining black congressman in the United States at that point was from Wilmington, North Carolina. But the white supremacists of North Carolina got organized in, in 1898 and ran a... Um, and, and, and they were so overt compared to today's vote suppressors and white supremacists. Would that our vote suppressors today were as honest as they were back then, although they're getting more and more on. They're beginning to say out loud the things they think. I, I mean, well, one of the things that, you know, you, you, I think you've, you've argued in, in, your, in your books is this notion of the Civil War, the shooting war ended, but the... Yeah the in many respects the 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 fundamentals of what we're driving that war has not and you know i think back to just that that notion of an ongoing counter revolution and an ongoing revolution yeah. and, and those moments where the revolution wins out seem very very narrow yeah. in terms of time right and then there's these long stretches cuz i'm quite convinced that you could draw a line from the Voting Rights Act in 65 to the Supreme Court in 2013, oh, yeah. uh, gutting Section 5. Right. And that is, that is an uninterrupted sort of slow moving process. And we are still in that sort of that process now. And it's, you know, when we talk about, I mean, just this past week, the, the, the implications of the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, when you look at what's going on in Florida, the disenfranchisement right. of, of, of felons, of felons and then yeah. with the use of a poll tax, right. I mean, that is a mirror. I mean, that is like a just a almost like a tracing of what was going on 150 years ago in the sort of post Reconstruction era. Well, that's very well put, Sam. And I've said this in many places in print that, you know, we, we live with the legacies of Reconstruction around it around us every day. Uh, if, if, for one thing, my lawyer friends tell me that close to two thirds of all litigation in American courts at one point or another come around to 14th Amendment litigation. Uh, we are forever debating what equality before the law actually means uh, in, in courts. Let's not forget Bush v. Gore, five to four, when the Supreme Court, ch court chose our president, argued it on the basis of equal protection of, under the 14th Amendment for the state of Florida. I mean, and on and on we could go. Gay rights on the, gay marriage on the other hand, from a different perspective, was a 14th Amendment decision. It was equality before the law. And John Roberts said, uh, yeah, I guess they're right. <laughs> um, uh, so it's all around us. And then you take the, the, uh, take the, the issue of federalism. My goodness, we don't talk about that enough. We, we have a state's rights Supreme Court right now, and it's about to get even more so, uh, perhaps. Um, I mean, Clarence Thomas is the most state's rights uh, Supreme Court justice since uh, some one of those Southerners in the late 19th century, which is so weird, but it's true. Uh, what is the proper relationship of federal power to state power? It's an eternal question in America. Now, the Civil War had a gigantic row over that right and we had you know that people had a right some people northerners who had won that war had a right in say 1870 to think that you know states rights had been really pretty well crushed here in the blood of antietam or gettysburg but no 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 not at all the the supreme court even with all of the members appointed by republican presidents 
by 1883 is going to basically wipe out the 14th Amendment and the famous civil rights cases of 1883 and say that, no, no, this discrimination issue, whether it's a hotel or a train or wherever, it can only be settled at the state level. <laughs> you know, which basically said, you know, the 14th Amendment doesn't mean anything. Anyway, Again and again. You mentioned Reagan. I mean, that's how Reagan launched his general campaign after the Republican exactly. convention was at the uh, Neshoba County Fair talking about states' rights. Exactly. Uh, and he went after unions, remember? He crushed uh, the air traffic control unions and then other unions. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, the anti-union movement in this country, the, the so-called right-to-work laws, are... <laughs> Are the uses, I mean, let's face it, the right wing in America has been very effective at using the language of the 14th Amendment, the language of equality to fight against those very achievements in equality yes. for women and, and black and brown and immigrant people and so on. They're very adept at that, to say the least. Um, can I ask so, you one, one, one final question that's a little bit sort of like tangential, but I, the, the post office. Obviously, yeah. playing a very big role in in all these questions about you know voting right now, um, the post office like this is another example of and I, and I think you know you, your work has sort of taught me more about the concept of history uh, in, in many oh, respects. In actual that's and, the point and, of doing history to just help us understand why it's so important. Well, honestly, like that why it's I, all around us. I, I I I lament that it it took me this long to sort of like understand that, but I guess it's You're doing better, very right? well at it. You're doing very well at it. But <laughs> but the post office is also another issue that like there was so much fighting in the, the it was the radical Republicans who you know it was sort of like a, a gave birth uh, to this notion of of the post office and its uh, ubiquitiness, I guess. Yeah. And and we're still it's still a, a, a contention on some level. You know, I, it's given me a renewed joy when I walk into a post office, you know, uh, sometimes it's a, you know, it's boring. It's something you have to do. You got to get some stamps. You got to mail something, but by God, it's a democratic institution. You know, it's, 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 it's one place almost all of us use. Now, not as much anymore because of FedEx and the internet and Amazon, but even Amazon uses it. <laughs> um, you know, the, po the postal service guys deliver Amazon packages all day, every day. Um, so, yeah, and an attack on that is just yet another way. Let's be honest about this. Higher voter turnout serves one of America's political parties. Lower voter turnout serves another of America's political parties. And the one wanting lower voter turnout has, is doing everything it can possibly do to depress, to suppress the turnout of Americans to vote. They are doing it because they've seen the demographics and the demographics have scared the hell out of them. One third of all the votes cast this election will be cast by African Americans, Asian Americans, and Hispanic Americans. And those numbers are growing like crazy every year. The number of vote, the voter turnout among young people in 2018 was unprecedented. Uh, Republicans, given the fact that they have become essentially the white people's party, are in trouble. They're, they're fighting against they're colliding with modernity again. And they're against most of the great changes of modernity. They can't even bring themselves to believe in climate change, um, you know, until they get burned in a forest, I guess. So we're living in the post office, it became this visible example. Do you remember when, uh, when um, oh, the delivery service had a strike? Uh, UPS. Uh, UPS, sorry. You know, those guys won their strike that year because people love UPS, it turns out. They love having things delivered by UPS. And people got behind them because they were a service that people tended to rely on and even love. The UPS guy in his brown shorts walks up, he's your friend. So, you know, there, there's a sense in which the right in America 
is fighting against uh, modernity itself. Now they win sometimes because they can uh, manage the rules and sometimes they win because of ideology in some cases. Um, but they're up against a demographic phenomenon that is not on their side. So they're in, I have a new piece coming out in, uh, actually it's in Die Zeit, the German weekly. Uh, they asked me to write a, a fairly long historical piece on voter suppression, the history of voter suppression. And that's coming out, I think, next week. It's just amazing the, 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 the measures, the methods that Republicans have turned to. And by the way, the template for that is Reconstruction too. I, I mean, there are all kinds of things that, that, that were methods that were used to keep black people from voting. Actually in Reconstruction though, they ultimately just used guns. Well, uh, David Blight, um, I can't tell you um, how how much I appreciate your coming on. Um, uh, we will put a link uh, to Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom on Majority.fm, and also a link to your um, your audio course that oh, you, uh, uh, on on the Civil War, which covers uh, re Reconstruction and, of course, um, the sort of the post Reconstruction era. It, it's it's been such an like important work in in my understanding of so many things i i can't tell you how much i appreciate you coming on well thanks so much sam thanks for having me i, I should update that lecture series sometime because the jokes are getting old i think well they still work they still fly it was <laughs> i appreciate it thanks so uh, much all right folks Thanks for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, I enjoyed that interview. I've listened back to it multiple times. I think he's just such a treasure. Go now, listen to his, whatever it is, 12-part series, 15-part series, um, Yale. You can find it. Um, if you just search your podcast descriptions, you can find it there. Um, very easy. All right, folks, we'll be back live tomorrow. We will see you then. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar